In the McCullough household with two parents working in the church, Easter Monday is our Easter holiday. Breakfast can be celebratory. Some years we plant a garden. And another we headed down to Harper's Ferry for a family hike. After the rush of Holy Week, Easter Monday is that day to soak in the aliveness of Christ, to claim his risenness even today. Yet inevitably, as the day proceeds, the glory fades. The evening news interrupts with war, bloodshed, political ugliness, and debt ceilings. The return to school on Tuesday means relocating backpacks and finishing up forgotten homework. The dog needs a bath. The smoke detector beeps, reminding us it's time to change the batteries. It's amazing how quickly the news of the day and the demands of life can divert our attention from the glorious fact that Christ is alive. The earliest accountings of the community formed by Christ's resurrection paint a different picture. Sixty days, let's say, after Mary Magdalene runs from the tomb, a steady crowd of persons gather daily to pray and learn and eat and pool their resources. Miracles abound. Wondrous signs assure them God is present. And although other parts of the New Testament will suggest this unity is not the entirety of the early church experience, something powerful is happening. You can feel it lift off the page. As Susan Johnson writes, in six short verses, we see a people whose faith in Jesus changes where they live, how they eat, the structure of their days, and their sense of obligation to one another. Their faith in Jesus enlarges their lives. It offers them joy, community, and meaning, the things that all of us search for. I read these verses, and I think how fleeting that Easter Monday moment can be, how different the church can feel today, and I wonder, how do we access that power? Perhaps you have experienced the power of a community grounded in Christ, offering its gifts to the world. When I lived in South Africa, I attended a Sunday evening church service at the church where I served. Unlike the morning's fuller, more formal one, this was held in a small chapel right off the main entrance, intentionally accessible to people from many walks of life. After the sermon, there was space for people to testify about how God had spoken to them that week. During the final hymn, persons would pray at the altar, and a meal was served after worship each week. Now, this congregation was not large. At its height, maybe two dozen, maybe three. It was a small witness, a tiny speck amid the trauma and economic injustice and ongoing violence happening on the streets of Johannesburg. But something powerful, something real, something holy happened in that simple chapel too. In his attempt to summarize the life of the newborn church, Luke, the writer of Acts, names practices that shape the character of this Holy Spirit-inspired community. He writes, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Those are four habits. Teaching, fellowship, eating, and worship. And these are the habits we, as God's people, formed by the resurrection, are to cultivate too. Luke uses the word prayers to describe worship, calling them the prayers, which suggests a liturgy, a regular practice of a community coming before God. Worship is that moment when we're drawn outside of ourselves. We move away from the, the thoughts and the worries and the responsibilities that consume us Monday to Saturday, and we turn as a people toward God. Worship should remind you how vast and glorious and mysterious and fiercely loving God is. And worship should remind you that you do not worship God alone, that there are other pilgrims from whom you can draw strength. Have you ever had your faith buoyed by listening to someone else singing beside you? Have you ever stopped someone at the end of worship and said, will you pray for this during your week? Have you ever felt encouraged by the smile offered to you at the door? We worship together, and God is amidst us. Next, the Christian community is guided by the apostles' teachings, which is a way of saying that the apostles shared with the newest believers their experience of walking alongside Jesus of hearing his stories, of experiencing his miracles, of meeting the risen Christ along the road, and knowing themselves empowered with the same capacity to heal and proclaim and form community. At each baptism, we ask parents to teach children the stories that shape our faith. And we ask ourselves to model the life of Jesus so that others can be similarly blessed. Who are the faithful ones that have shaped your faith? What mothers and fathers and pew parents and Sunday school teachers and acolyte coordinators and youth volunteers have shown you the stories of Jesus. As we do this together, the stories and the presence of Christ sink into us. They become as familiar to us as the stories we tell of our own grandparents, our own genealogies. And this enables God to continue being alive and at work amongst us. Now, closely linked to the apostles' teaching is a space of fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia, and it's such a richer word, I think. It, it means sharing things in common. A fellowship of Christians are those whose hearts have been linked to Christ, and because they share this common connection to Jesus, their lives are linked to one another's. We're not linked because we like each other. We're not linked because we live beside each other on the same street. We're not linked because we went to the same school or have the same profession. We're linked by Christ. And that means that our fellowship is more than socializing. It's not chit-chat. It's looking at one another and expecting to see in another's face the presence of Christ. And it's expecting another to respond to the Christ at work in us. At another time and in another season, I witnessed a community walk with a person who was dying well before their time. 
Amid the pain, the church offered tenderness to a family and to one another. Amid the flurry of doctors' appointments and medicines needed, they stepped in with rides, grocery runs, and childcare. Amid the whys and the what ifs, they cried, they prayed, and they sought to heal the limited number of things they could. And when the person died on Easter Monday, the day felt significant. Amid the pain, there was a quality of blessing, as if in the unfairness of it all, God had blended a touch of assurance about God's eternity. This is koinonia. This is sharing together our common life in Christ. Now, in Christ's life, when community happens, it often happens over a shared meal. The earliest Christians ate together often. You know what happens at a meal. Food, that stuff essential to living, is passed around the table. And as we watch what people eat, we know something of their taste. We might know something of their cooking skills. We might together acknowledge our shared hunger. And as we take seconds and pour another glass to drink, we tell stories. Jesus used the meal to tell us of his life's deepest purpose. Here is body, my body, for you. Here is my blood for you. A meal is shared and a community is born. The so worship, teaching, eating, and koinonia, by these practices, God's spirit bursts into newly formed Christians and gave them power. All who believed were together and they had all things in common, continued Luke. They would sell their possessions and distribute their proceeds to all, as any had need. So where they lived changed. What they did each day changed. How they ate changed. And a new economy was born. The economy of God where no one is hungry, no one is without shelter, and there is enough to share. I suspect that I have told you this story before, but it came back to me as I wrote this sermon. When I was a teenager, my home church in Orlando faced a dilemma of an uh, increasing number of people who were using their outdoor portico and outside walkways to sleep at to sleep on at night. Orlando, of course, is in Central Florida. And in the 80s, the population of unhoused persons grew dramatically. After a series of intense conversations and church committees, the decision was made to open the doors of the Fellowship Hall each evening so that those who slept outside in the decision was not without conflict. It required a great deal of planning and coordination. But over the next year, each evening, the doors were open. The intake process followed. A meal provided. And those who needed it were given a roof for the night. News of the practice spread to other churches, and they called and offered to help. They wanted to take some evenings. Christmas rolled around and our Jewish brothers and sisters called and said, we want to take Christmas Eve so that you all can worship. The news of the ministry spread such that the council, city council of Orlando felt compelled to act and began much needed city services. Here, the economy of God change the city, one act by another, 
grounded in prayer and worship and seeing in one another the face of Christ. It is daunting to know the news around us outside and to try to hold on to the aliveness of Christ's presence among us. But in these habits, cultivated over a lifetime, the Holy Spirit works within us, and we together are changed. Amen. <laughs>